So to get underway, I'll throw it over to John Glass, who's given some thought as to time allocation that a CIO gives on a, on a daily basis, and I think you've done some research. Indeed. Thanks, Paul, and good morning, everyone. I thought a good way to start the session would be to report to you on the results of a very broad and extensive survey that I carried out on the Chief Investment Officer community within Australia. And I asked them many questions, and I'm going to highlight a couple of them in a brief slide presentation. This first question I asked them was, how do you spend your time as a CIO? And whilst I don't think we should go through every answer and what it means, what I'd like to do is draw your attention to a couple of those bars, if you can see them. Um, on the right-hand side, the largest bar is called reporting to trustees. And I think that's exactly correct. In other words, that chief investment officers in aggregate view their job as primarily engaging in effective reporting to trustees, uh, whether in written form or in oral delivery. And then coming in a close second, we have um, operational duties. And that's in many ways the hidden aspect of the job of Chief Investment Officer. There is a huge amount of work to be done on the operational side when it comes to dealing with investment managers and custodians and consultants. And that, I think, naturally figures as number two. Then if we move down the list, I think there's almost an absence there in the sense that we have two bars, one called investment strategy, the other called reading and research. I personally would like to see those emphasised more strongly. I think one of the aspects of a chief investment officer's role that is not given enough um, credence, is not given enough weight, is that of going into a room and thinking, of engaging with investment managers and other people to learn about trends in the industry. I think um, if you could design the role from scratch, you would want to upweight that aspect of it. And then finally, um, and rather surprisingly, right down the bottom is a tiny little bar called fostering of internal team. Personally, I think that's a misspecification. I think that is the other critical column that supports the whole structure of effective chief investment officership. So that was the first result from the survey. The second is how do you build a successful investment team? And I thought for your amusement I would classify the answers along the, um, the, the beautiful statistical things we all love, mean, standard deviation and correlation. And under mean, I'd like to draw out the uh, strong response that you need strong quantitative skills inside your team, and in particular IT skills, because so much work is done on Excel spreadsheets. And I think that is important, that's something I agree with, but it came out strongly in the survey. Under uh, sigma standard deviation, kind of a false placing, but that's okay. I love this quote, pleasant to all external money managers, a friend to none. And finally, under correlation, how does the team fit together? We all know from our background working inside corporations or in families, it's all about how to fit people together. And we've got comments such as you need a good cultural fit, you need team players, you need complementary skills, particularly from people who have a non-finance background. And in that regard, I mentioned a recent recruit we made to Media Super's investment team, where on that person's CV appeared the phrase lexical density. I've no idea what that is, but it sounds good, and that person has very strong communication skills. <laughs> so let me run through very quickly some other things that came out in the survey. Um, what are some top tips for successful investing? What makes a good investor? And I like the, um, the one that came out strongly, build monitoring dashboards. I think that's a, a recent theme. I think even the regulator has picked it up recently. There is nothing more satisfying for an investor than to look at a dashboard and see things pointing up, things pointing down, things in red, things in green, hopefully more in green than red. Uh, which brings in the second, and that is focusing on risk analytics. That's one of my personal passions in life. Uh, a third tip is to consult widely, which I think ties in with the next, have a strong knowledge of history. And now my strong knowledge of history, to the extent that it is strong, has gone to understanding 500 years of uh, Dutch real estate history, which I think is fantastic. Um, then, in order to collect a couple of anecdotes, I got the following. Um, if you can't explain it in plain English, you don't understand it. And we'll come back to that later, because communication, as we'll all draw upon in our discussion, is so critical to the role of a successful chief investment officer. And finally, 
This is a direct quote. What's a top CIO skill? Answer, humility and the ability to admit you're wrong, in brackets. So far, I haven't been wrong, but maybe in the future it could happen. <laughs> and by the way, that didn't come from me. <laughs> Thank you. I think it might be interesting to see a trustee's view of, of what skills a good CIO possesses um, outside you know, purely technical investment skills. Yeah, well, well clearly technical investment skills are important, but I think there's a range of other skills that we all see. Um, and I think um, John's graph of, of all of the things that a CIO actually has to do and spend their time says to me that versatility is really important because you've got to have somebody that's really up in the strategic big picture but can delve into the detail when necessary. And I think that's probably quite a, a challenge. And also leadership. Um, and I mean, that's kind of a, a fuzzy word that could a bit of motherhood, I think Ken was saying. But um, to me, that's about having an opinion, um, being able to challenge and discuss uh, new ideas, drive new ideas, to be able to look forward, um, to um, be confident, a whole range of things to actually be able to objectively lead um, your team and influence your board around investment ideas. And I suppose allied with that is really communication skills and relationship skills, and that is across a whole range. I think John just referred to that too. With trustees, obviously, if you're spending all your time uh, reporting to trustees, you've got to have pretty good communication skills with trustees. You've got to have a really good, strong um, relationship with asset consultants and service providers, and I th also think with other fund staff. And I think one of the speakers yesterday mentioned, um, actually, making sure that your investment strategy is not separate from your business strategy. So I think that emphasises the need to work across the whole of the fund, not just focused on the technical investment side. Um, and allied to that is having a cultural fit with the fund, um, being a aligned with the fund values, um, organisational skills, what, t what you actually spend your time on because it's a very big job um, and it, you really need to focus on the right things and maybe we'll come back to, to that. Um, and the basic things, I think, about being trustworthy and ethical and, and, as John says, having a bit of humility humility, and using your influence wisely would probably be the key things that I'd mention. One of the... Uh, sorry, Ken. Yeah, I'd, Paul, I'd, um, humility's great. I'd like, to set the, uh, I'd like to set the scene and say that I think the CIO's job is the best job in the world. You're managing billions of dollars, billions of other people's dollars. You have as many friends as you want. <laughs> <laughs> They're sitting in the tables in front of us. And you have enormous power. You have a power over your, over your board. You control the information. It's technical. It's a huge responsibility and it feels good. But with that best job in the world, there's a price. And this price is what I call, I think, the sword of Damocles, is that every day, you're, how well you're going, there's a scoreboard and it is seen every day. Every day, something can go wrong. Every day, the markets will move against you. And I know of at least two CIOs who regularly get up at 2 and 3 in the morning to look at the screens. Not that they can do anything about it, but they're just anxious. So it's the best job in the world, but it comes with quite a price in some other respects. And I think you know, as we have this discussion, that balance is quite, uh, quite interesting. I guess that takes us to the most important relationship, and that's the relationship between the CIO and the board and how they interact. and and how that um, can be an effective relationship. Do you have any, any view on, on how that relationship should run? Yeah, well, um, well, let me, I think rather than try and answer that straight off, Paul, I think the, um, there, are, there, are, there are many models that you could have of this relationship of the CIO, the CEO, the board, and God bless them, the asset consultants. And it depends very much, I think, on the character and the nature of the people. Um, I'll have, so, if I, 
mention some examples. We have examples where the um, asset consultant is effectively the CIO. And the CIO might be a check or a balance to the advice that is given by the um, asset consultant to the board. At the other end of the extreme, it is the CIO who is running that entire relationship and the asset consultant works, as it were, as a staff member of that CIO and there could be, and there is a sort of a blend in between where it's a partnership. And there are issues also which uh, maybe a trustee might like to discuss about, about where, who, who the CIO should be accountable for and how that relates with the role of the CIO, uh, the asset consultant as well. I think that one of the most important aspects of the CIO's relationship with the board, which is clearly critical, is having a respect for the board process um, and, a, and the governance process. And I, there's a question down here, when, you should, when should you fire your CEO? And I think it's probably when um, the CIO doesn't actually have respect for the investment governance process that you have in place. I mean, I haven't actually seen that in operation, but I think that that's a really important thing because the CIO and other staff are clearly the servant of the board and it's really their role to assist the board to make the best possible decisions that they can. Um, and that requires a whole lot of the skills that we, talking, we talked about before, but particularly objectivity and giving unbiased advice, um, being open and transparent, um, and understanding that the board are not experts. So really about respecting that role that the board plays in terms of governance um, and making decisions, but not necessarily delving into the detail. Now, John. Yes, I'd like to pick up on that and uh, revert to something Ken said. In terms of pricing of the portfolio, in terms of staying up till two in the morning to see what unfolds on Wall Street or in Europe, I think that brings into sharp relief the, the different roles of the trustees, who, let's remind ourselves, are responsible for the whole investment portfolio and make all the decisions, as uh, distinct from, if we go down the spectrum, to the people who are looking at portfolios all day long. So for me, the quintessential agent in that regard is the hedge fund manager. Those people don't sleep. So the CIO is somewhere in the middle, and that's where we'll see variation across funds. So for example, at Media Super, we have uh, an outsourcing arrangement with our custodians such that we price weekly. That means that the investment team reviews the performance of the listed managers, equities and bonds, on a weekly basis. Obviously, there's no point in reviewing the property and infrastructure managers on a weekly basis. And so, uh, whereas the uh, trustees, the investment committee, get to see the portfolio um, at their meetings and obviously uh, more frequently upon request, we're dealing with the portfolio every day, oh, sorry, at least every week. And so that brings back that topic you mentioned, Angela, of ethics. When you're working under a set of delegations as a CIO, you have an ethical responsibility to deal with things that you see on a regular basis as an executive and where appropriate, bring it to the attention of your trustees, but not do so inappropriately. You hardly want to be ringing up your trustees once a week saying, oh, manager number seven in Australian equities underperformed by 3%, what do we do? That I think would be inappropriate. On the other hand, you want to make sure that you adhere to your delegations and report back as appropriate to your trustees on everything that you've done effectively behind the scrim where they have delegated you those authorities. You've moved the topic a little bit onto uh, delegations and you know, all the common sort of the, the best practice stuff is talks about separating the roles of the board and then the management team uh, so the, ro the role of the board is largely about strategy and observing performance, but nearly everything should be delegated down to the management team of implementation, picking managers and the like. That is becoming the uh, sort of the, the, the general mantra. I must admit that on thinking about this, I'm a little bit more cautious about going that far these days. At the end of the day, trustees are accountable and responsible for the performance and the activities of the fund. And an internal management team is not. And it can have its own incentives and its own objectives. And there's still, I, I'm starting to rethink that it is uh, 
um, that the, the board and the, and the investment committee should still have a very strong awareness and, a, and an understanding of what that management team is doing underneath them. And I think pushing delegations too far can lead to, a, you know, to put you in a horrible position. I agree, Ken, but I think it's about getting that delegation right the, and the gov investment governance focus at the board or a board and investment committee. And there, as you say, there's a whole lot of different models out there which, um, and people do it, different funds do it differently. The way that HEST has evolved and we've strongly had the view um, over the last number of years that we don't want to have an investment committee. So we do most of the investment work at the board or delegate it. Um, but when I say delegate, we might delegate um, appointment of managers below a certain threshold. So if they're incubator managers, we might delegate that to management and, asset con and the asset consultant working together. The rest of it does come to the board in a governance sense. So I think you're right, there is certainly um, a concern about how much we delegate. Um, but I think critical to that, in my point of view, and critical to our model is having the asset consultant there as a partner um, to the um, CIO, um, but reporting to the board. In my view, that's absolutely critical that the asset consultant reports to the board, that the board has um, two views, if you like. Um, often it's a partnership view from both sides, but sometimes um, th there are different views, and we actually encourage. Um, our asset consultant and CIO to have different views, present those to the board and um, we'll make the decision based on um, the objective information that they give us and that's pretty challenging, particularly to the CIO. Um, when I um, talked to Rob, our CIO, about what I was going to talk about, he said, well, if you, the CIO needs to be prepared to be really frank and fearless. Um, when debating with an asset consultant to the board. And I think it's the same with the asset consultant. It's allowing them to be frank and fearless and give really good advice, unrestricted and un unconstrained. So I think that's an important part of the model which I wouldn't like to see lost. And I think that brings up the whole issue of how does the trustee board resolve the kind of conflict that can and will arise between an external advisor such as Ken and an internal portfolio manager such as me. It would be probably a bad thing if we agreed on everything. We happen to, but that's another matter. It would be a bad thing. So um, how does the trustee board um, build a culture that accepts conflict, resolves conflict, and does so in a constructive way, and a uh, constructive way that leads to good outcomes? And that's um, about not having a culture of blaming people when things go wrong. Isn't it? Yep. When decisions are go wrong. John, um, talking about uh, relationships with the board, and you've got to present things to the board, and the board aren't from the industry, oh. right? They're, well, they're not from the investment industry, and no one has a brain like yours, you know, PhD in mathematics from somewhere. And <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you go about? You know, what's the challenge of trying to, to um, bring your ideas to a board of people who only look at these things once a week, uh, once a month, or a quarter, or whenever they do? This must be a, a huge challenge for you. Yes, and, and I, I'm going to agree with Ken, it's uh, to my embarrassment. On the plane coming up here, I was reading a paper called The Formula That Killed Wall Street how the Gaussian copula works. So that's the kind of person I am. And I think that's a really important point because um, investment professionals uh, can be very nerdy, and we know that, but what can be said about them is that they think about investments seven days a week. Uh, trustees, on the other hand, are generalists, um, always incredibly intelligent people, but nonetheless, they are generalists. They are non-executives. And I think that distinction between non-executive and executive is coming through this discussion loud and clear. We are executives, we execute. The trustees are non-executives who make decisions. So to come back to your excellent question, I don't think there is an answer, but the components that will build a successful outcome clearly fall upon the chief investment officer to have strong communication skills and to be able to explain Gaussian copulas in plain English, which I've never succeeded in doing. Um, Clearly, there's a responsibility falling on the shoulders of trustees to come closer to an understanding of what is an ever-complexifying, more difficult marketplace. 
Um, Ken and I have been around a long time. Uh, the market was a lot simpler 30 years ago than it is today. Uh, credit, uh, you know, CDOs and credit default swaps simply didn't exist. CDOs are complex, credit default swaps are complex. We've had to learn about these things. We never thought about them 30 years ago. Can I make one last comment on this subject, uh, Paul? I think um, a, CI a CIO has not done their job properly if they're only presenting half the story to the board. And there's a great temptation for a CIO to be able to do, to do that. They control the information, they know what is right, they know what is the outcome at the end. And so you can present, we all know this, we can present an argument that leads a board to a particular conclusion. But I think the CIO's real responsibility is, yes, that's the point I want to get to, but here are the pros and the cons. These are the, these are the issues that you as a board have to weigh up. And if there was one message that I'd like to leave is that boards should continually put pressure on the CIOs to get that balanced view. What if you were wrong? Is there another view? Have you considered that? And, we, and we'll make that assessment. But I don't know whether you agree with that, Angela. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it really is about getting unbiased advice um, so that boards can make proper decisions. And the board is really only as good as the information that's put up to it, in my view. And it is challenging um, when people don't have the technical skills. And I don't expect the board to have technical skills, but they do, um, in my experience, have critical thinking skills. They can suss out. You know, they've got a lot of people, particularly come from um, the union side, have really good forensic skills. And they can suss out when they're being delivered a line. <laughs> and um, it's not, not, it's not um, unbiased or objective. So I think there are some, some really good skills that people have. We actually have a rule on the HESTA board, if we can't understand it, we won't invest it in it. So it is really incumbent on um, the CIO and the asset consultant to explain it to us. I think the only thing that we haven't invested in that was brought to us a few years ago was Alpha Transport. We just couldn't get our heads around it. We said we weren't going to invest in it and that really proved to be the right decision. Uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to throw to my third and final slide, if it could kindly oblige and come up on the screen. Not this one here. There's nothing interesting on this slide. Help. <laughs> Is anyone there? I wanted to show a slide that addresses, for me, quite a burning issue, and gosh, I'll have to keep talking, which is, thank you, um, how to get all of us to think what, in what I call the domain of probability. In fact, I think I stole that line from Roger Irwin. Uh, it's a really smart line. I like it. I think uh, if I can explain this to you properly, what I'm getting at is how we can go about doing that. So what I've done here is I've used an Excel spreadsheet. Anyone could carry out this experiment at home to simulate the tossing of a coin. So if you imagine an unbiased coin that comes up heads or tails, the very first time you toss it, you mark up one for a head and down one for a tail. You then do it again. And if it comes up heads, you mark up one tails you mark down one. So you can imagine as you move forward in time, you're simply recording the cumulative number of heads uh, minus tails. And what you'd expect, and this is uh, 10,000 trials, and that's the, the, the power of Monte Carlo, you can do this thousands of times. What you might expect is that with the law of large numbers, which we all understand, the, the outcome would be roughly zero. So in other words, over a lot of tosses of the coin, there'd be as many heads as tails, give or take a few exceptions. And so the line would uh, gravitate to the zero line. In fact, what happens, and you set up Monte Carlo so when you press F9, it does it again. You can do it thousands of times till your head goes dizzy. You see these enormous trends. You see these runs of heads taking you up or tails taking you down, which is not to say head, head, head. It's probably head, head, tail, head, head, head. This surprises even professional statisticians. And the point I'm driving at is that somewhere in this is a lesson that says luck and skill in the world of investment management are strongly intertwined. It's very hard to separate the two, much as you'd like to. And one of the jobs that all of us have to do, both trustees, chief investment officers, and I'll include consultants, is to learn to think more effectively in the domain of probability, because all investing is about making a, an assessment of the future where you know things may not work out according to your thesis 
And I think that's where you have to start assigning probabilities. And it's when you can assign probabilities of outcomes with the actual numerical value of outcomes. So for example, plus 1% is an outcome in return space, but there's only a 70% chance of getting it, that you can have a more mature conversation at trustee board level about investment outcomes. Any views on that? Um. They must be very interesting meetings that you have, <laughs> <laughs> John. <laughs> Good luck. Well, <laughs> what about uh, board capture? Should the board seek advice from other sources than the CIO? Um, go outside, get frank advice from you know, different places? Well, from my perspective, I think that that's why I'm really strong about the uh, asset consultant role being reporting to the board, because I think that's really about power sharing. Yep. I think the key thing that we want to um, guard against is having one person being controlling the power relationship in this. Um, and I, that's what you mean by capture, yep. I think. Um, so I think it is really about having as diverse a source of information sources and advice as you can get. So you, you'd prefer the advisors to come directly to the board and give their briefing papers rather mm. than it being sort of regurgitated through the, the CIO? Mm. I certainly don't like the model where the CIO vets or the CEO vets everything yeah. that comes from the asset consultant before it gets to the board. I think it, the asset consultant really needs to report directly to the board. And But there are other models out there, aren't there, Ken, and I'm sure they do work, but that's really my preference in terms of avoiding capture. And there's also a question on here about um, what are the advantages and dangers of having an investment professional on the board, and I think the danger is this issue of capture. Again, you've got one person that has a whole lot of technical expertise that perhaps the other board members don't, and they will um, perhaps leave it to that person to do more of the work. Um, that person gets more power because they can say, well, I'm the investment expert and I know about these things, so just leave them to me. So I think there are some real dangers in that. So for me, the whole, all of these relationships are about making sure it's about power sharing and that no one person has the ability to capture yeah, the Yeah, there's agenda. a couple of interesting um, observations here and this is sort of exposing oneself a little bit. Um, it's worth uh, thinking about what are the incentives and the motivations of various people who are in this chain of decision making? And when you look at what your structure and what your reporting lines are, think about not just the skills of the people, but what their incentives and motivations are. I know that the motivation of an asset consultant is to retain our employment. And we retain our employment by attempting to do a good job and to prevent disasters. A CIO might feel much more secure in their employment than an asset consultant. It might change the nature of the incentives of, and motivations of why they're doing that job. What is it that they're trying to achieve? If you have an expert sitting on the board, which I'd encourage, they have their own particular in incentives and motivations of what they're trying to achieve as individuals. And then flowing it down the other way, is what do you do if you disagree with each of these parties? What do you do if you disagree strongly with a technical expert on the board? Can you sack them? No, do you have to agree with them? What if you continually disagree with these people? Do they stay on the board? The same goes with the CIO. I found, it's interesting, Angela saying that they like a difference of views at Hester um, okay, from the consultant and from the CIO. My experience is that if there is a difference in view that is brought to a board, 99 times out of 100, the vote will go in favour of the CIO. It's an interesting behavioural issue. And it will go there because there is a responsibility, I think, from the board to support the internal staff. That doesn't worry us terribly, but I think it understand those behavioural issues and the incentives and the messages that are being sent out um, as, as you deal with the roles of each of these uh, players in the game. I'd like to um, come back to what I think of as the role of the CIO 
Um, I've used the phrase portfolio manager, which some people may find controversial, but I think less controversial is the, uh, the use of the, uh, the P's that consultants so much love, uh, performance, process and people. We've talked about people, a CIO uh, typically runs a team of investment analysts, um, uh, a CIO reports to a board and a CEO. We mustn't forget there is a chief executive officer in place. Um, but um, before I get to process, let's not forget the, the thing that keeps um, chief investment officers coming to work each day is that they are fanatically dedicated to generating good performance, whatever that might mean. We know it's a broad concept. Um, we'd all love to be uh, the best performing fund in the universe. It doesn't quite work that way, but we are motivated on a day by day, hour by hour basis through good performance. That's what drives us. That's the kind of people we are. But the other thing that sits behind that that's I think really appreciated is that just as fund managers have a process for controlling people and generating good performance, we also have started to build our own processes. And so a good CIO, I think, will have a process. And it may not be immediately visible to the trustees and certainly not to the outside world, but it will consist in adherence to certain tasks. So just to throw an example out there, uh, our portfolio team meets once a week, Monday afternoon from three to five. You'd probably think if you attended, it's the dullest meeting in the world. But we love it because we're talking about performance, we're talking about strategy, we're talking about the future. Um, in the case of our fund, all decisions on managers are made by the board, and that's fine, that's how it should be, but there's a whole lot of stuff we need to be looking at on a regular basis, and that's the passion that brings us to work each week. And maybe I'd just comment on the, comment, the, the challenge I think that you must have, I'm sure, John, is how do you make spend your time on the right things and really how do you make sure that you're spending your time and I divide it up into strategy implementate portfolio implementation and operations and we've done a, a bit of looking at that and found that a lot of the effort is going into um, portfolio implementation which is managers and monitoring them and and perhaps not as much as we would like on strategy so how do you um, make time to think um, to think about strategy, all of those things. And one of the things that we've decided to do is to set up, instead of um, bringing investment advisors onto the board or having a separate investment committee, we're setting up an investment advisory committee, which is really um, some, a, a group of people out in the field that are investment professionals, if you like, um, that can come along and give advice to the CIO and the board about strategic issues, just thought leadership, if you like. I think it's a bit like some of the um, committees that universities have around thought leadership. So it's a thought leadership committee. They don't have any uh, governance responsibility, no responsibility for actually make, implementing or talking about individual fund managers, but really at, at the strategic level. I think that's a critical point that you've made, Angela. Uh, CIOs necessarily spend a lot of time on implementation matters. They would rather not, but it's what they have to do because if they didn't do it, it would be a case of dereliction of duty. What they aspire to is to spend more time on strategy. And so as a practical way of doing that, I think one simple method is to go overseas at least once a year and open um, ears and minds to trends that are taking place in the rest of the world and not feel constrained inside the eggshell called Australia waiting for overseas people to come and visit you. And uh, in addition to that, you have to read frequently, you have to talk to people, you have to listen, and you have to be open to new ideas all the time. And so your point's a good one. If we could possibly get more strategy happening and a little bit less operational stuff, it would be to the credit and benefit of the industry. I think uh, some CEOs uh, can help themselves in this area, John. Um, there are some who, CIOs, there are some who like to be busy, who want to look at the next opportunity, the next deal, the next transaction, the next thing. And there are some that I see who almost do nothing, it would appear, and who are holding back and just looking at the big picture and realising where the true value comes. And uh, I won't say one's better than the other, but I certainly, it certainly makes one's life a lot easier for the, for the latter, where there is not this temptation to have to look at every particular opportunity that is brought to them, every, every new uh, product, every new manager, but to say, what drives value for this fund? 
how do I get access to that value and what is my role really in making those particular recommendations and calls in terms of getting that value into the fund. And I, and I would think that if we could get CIOs to spend more time thinking about that, we'd all be probably better off. I think that's a great point because to my, <clears throat> my way of thinking, investment has to be a mixture of the abstract and the practical. To divorce one from the other leads to uh, bad outcomes and you only need to read the kind of research that academics carry out. No offence to academics, it's useful research, but it tends to be a statistical analysis of thousands of investment opportunities. For example, they look at a database of hedge funds and come to a conclusion about hedge fund performance. Whereas consultants and CIOs know that it's all about the particulars of a hedge fund, let's take that as an example, and that you learn from investing in a vehicle. In fact, that's the only way you learn, in my opinion, about portfolio management. You put money to work and you watch the outcome, you learn from your mistakes and you build on your successes. And so I think, again, we're coming back to that mixture uh, that Angela alerted us to, which is strategy and implementation. My response is you actually have to do both, even though you prefer the strategy to the implementation. Paul, uh, there's a question uh, that's been asked which could go to John, and the question is, if uh, the asset consultant is reporting to the board, isn't that undermining the CIO? What do you think about that, John? Yeah, a good <laughs> controversial question. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, I, th I think we can all work together to get the best outcome. The consultants, in our case Frontier, they have a huge amount of knowledge. Uh, we benefit from that both at the executive level and clearly our trustees also benefit from it. So to me, it's all about managing the flow of information, getting the right information to the trustees so that they can make decisions. I'm not so bothered by it coming from two directions or even three or four. And in fact, at Media Super, we, we will use other consultants uh, from time to time. So there's a whole management issue around how to get advice as well as the portfolio management um, carried out by the executive into the minds and hearts of the trustees. That's a process that has to be managed. It's not perfect, but I think it's a good thing. And to me that really pinpoints a key skill of the CIO is really about getting the best out of service providers. The, you know, working in partnership um, and actually getting the best out of the service provider, who, whoever they might be. Um, clearly, and that's in an outsourcing model. I think there's a, uh, a question here, and sorry we're taking over a bit here, Paul, um, about um, how do things change as funds insource? And I think that that really changes the whole game, doesn't it, Ken? Well, I think it would. Imagine you're a CIO and you've been running um, the top down, the, the structure of the portfolio, and now you are responsible for 10% of the portfolio, buying stocks, selling stocks, risk, controls, all those things. Every day, as a CIO, your performance is going to be very visible. And I, I think there could be a real tendency to focus on that 5% or 10% of the portfolio because that is what you can deal with immediately. And there, is a, there, there could be a tendency to, to, to divert the, the, the focus onto that point and away from the bigger issues. So I'm not saying it can't be done. In fact, I think it's been done very successfully in places, but it's something that has to be very carefully thought about. And, and clear structures and to make sure that the, the minor things don't dominate the big things. That's to me the biggest issue. I think we'd be interested to know is how, how does a board review the performance of a CIO? Is it just purely on returns or is there some greater overall sort of benchmark? That's an interesting question because I'd probably argue that that's probably the role of the CEO to, to review the performance of the CIO in terms of a management relationship. And then report to the board. And then report to the board and have a discussion with the board about um, their views on the CIO's performance. But it's really, in my view, a management issue. Do you agree with that, John? Uh, it come from the CEO? Yeah, we, we haven't board. talked enough about the CEO, but to the extent that Angela puts the CIO in a reporting line up to the CEO, I think that's absolutely correct and how it should be done. Well, I'm not so sure. I think uh, the CIO effectively reports to the investment committee and the chair of the investment committee. And I think that that relationship between the chair of the investment committee and the CIO is critical. 
of course, the CEOs around, but there are some CEOs who don't take a very active role on the investment committee side of things. I think it's uh, a lot more complex than the way that you've described it. I'll, I'll take a, a, a level a little bit extra. I think I have seen examples where CIOs are put under a fair bit of pressure from trustees um, or other related parties to make certain recommendations. They may or may not agree with those, but there is pressure. And the CIO needs support. And in this regard, I think they've got a very lonely job. And the CEO has to be the support, really critical support for the CIO. These things do happen. We can't avoid it. There, there are a whole lot of reasons that these pressures can, can arise. And when you're dealing with billions of dollars of money, every mandate has got a value. There's a hell of a lot of pressure there. And the CI, CEO must be there to provide support, I think, to the CIO. But a good practical example where the CEO's input is essential would be when the trustees, uh, with some advice from their CIO and consultants, are deliberating on the current range of member investment choice options that are on display, whether in the superannuation or the pension phase. To me, in contemplating any change or the status quo in that regard, that's a business issue as well as an investment issue, therefore critically must have the CEO involved alongside the CIO. So are you saying the CEO sets the, the accountabilities and measurable outcomes rather than the board, or does it come through the board, through the CEO, down to the CIO? I would agree with that latter, that there's strategy that the board sets for the CEO to implement, which has a component of investments that the CIO is responsible for, and other components where, frankly, the CIO has no remit and uh, sometimes not much interest. So chain of command, you're yep. saying. When we talk about CIOs and we're talking about um, differences in knowledge on boards, maybe it's a question for John, what do you do to, to make sure that your board is understanding your message? One thing we do is we have regular education evenings for the board and that's an opportunity for us to bring in an investment expert to talk on a topic where we feel uh, unbiased, uh, neutral education is entirely the, the outcome we want. And so that person or those people will come in, sit down and talk to the trustees. My job is simply to arrange for it to happen. And over several glasses of lemonade, we discuss important investment topics. And it's simply a case of allowing trustees to ask questions and bring up their level of education on a particular topic, whether it's um, the prospect for future inflation in Australia or the role of annuities in a super fund, uh, doesn't matter, it could be any number of topics, but we think it's critical for our trustees to have such sessions laid on on their behalf. And I, I'd agree with that. I think trustee training, however you call it, is really important. And um, that's where we've really moved with, with ma manager presentations. We don't do beauty parades, but when we do do, um, say, a review of Australian equities, we'll get a couple of our Australian equity managers in to talk about the market and what's going on. Not necessarily talk about their product, um, but to talk about the market and to educate trustees. So I think that's really the direction which we've gone. Plus, you know, we're having regular sessions on some of the more complicated things like currency, Um, whether we throw it open to the, the floor for some questions now, I think we're coming to the end of our, our time. Um, Paul, there's I, I a terrific question here about uh, our um, super fund CIOs as uh, good as the fund manager CIOs. Well, I know what the answer is in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, but it's a, I, it's, I reckon it's a fantastic question. But the issue is that I'd say they do two completely different jobs. The CIO within a, uh, a fund has a major r responsibility, not only in the, it, they're in every, every man job. They've got to look at asset allocation, manage, manager selection, implementation, manage uh, relationships, and then communicate all that to a board to try and get that achieved in time in order to get something done. That is a big, big ask. A CIO inside a funds management business 
is largely dealing with a whole lot of um, um, individuals who have a very um, confident sense of their own uh, abilities. And, <laughs> and how do they manage that and keep that team going? Um, it's a, it's a really a, a very different job. And I would think that uh, if I was looking for a CIO in an external business, I doubt that I would be looking for CIOs from um, a super fund and vice versa. I think they're, they're quite different roles, but it's a, it's a great question. And I, like I can agree um, completely with what Ken has said. I've worked inside funds management firms. Um, and to quote the Earl of Chesterfield, I've seen the coarse ropes and dirty pulleys on the inside. It's a different business, different people, different processes. Uh, you can't compare a CIO from one organisation of fund manager with a CIO from a super fund. They're different people. I think that probably brings us back to the issue we were talking about before about um, what happens when you insource, when you actually start managing money internally and what are the implications for the funds. And I think they are and the role of the CEO, I think they're quite profound because there's a whole range of issues around compensation, which I think yes. trustees you know, have trouble getting their heads around when it's in-house. There's how does it change the cultural um, fit with the whole organisation, especially if your investment team is getting to a size that's similar to, to your other teams. It's a whole range of challenges. Yes. There's a good question there. Can, I, can a CIO be around for too long? Well, it's 30 years too long? I don't know. <laughs> I think uh, the investment world is one, and I would say this, that as you, it's one of the few industries that you get better as you get older. <laughs> there is no doubt about it. <laughs> Does everyone agree with that? <laughs> you just see more, you've learnt more, you've heard it all before. Those experiences, I think, uh, just make you better and better. Um, and, you know, Warren Buffett, I don't know how old he's getting, but Sir John Templeton at 95 thought he was the best investor ever and he still was making those long-term decisions. I think it is uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the nice things about this particular industry. Yeah. Well, you certainly don't end up with a sore back at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I think the critical thing is that the CIO needs to grow with the fund because I mean, the, our funds, many of them are having phenomenal growth and the CIO has got to be able to grow and, and grow their role with, the, with that growth because what CIOs do in smaller funds is quite different, quite different to what they're doing in, in larger funds. And as funds like Hester, 20 billion now, 100 billion in 15 years time, it's going to be a completely different world for, for the CIO and the investment team. Yeah. I think that's a good point to finish up on. So would everyone thank our speakers today. They've been a fantastic talk.